Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host, and thanks so much for joining in. So, some of you guys know, at least if you follow my social media accounts or read my blog, that I'm very interested in evidence-based tips for preventing disease or slowing the aging process. And, you know, when it comes to health and disease prevention stuff or wellness stuff in general, it's common to see people share anecdotes on social media, especially. Uh, I see them on Instagram all the time. Or sometimes I even see people advising others based on mostly anecdotal evidence, uh, which isn't which isn't wise. Um, and learning the levels of evidence is like a whole lifelong process too. Like what's quality evidence and what's not? It's really tricky to do that. Um, but anecdotes are important. They are. They're important because they can help generate a hypothesis that then needs to be tested in a systematic way which will then help support that there truly is a relationship there, whatever that is, causal, positive correlation, negative correlation, whatever. But you have to be careful with anecdotes. You don't want to run to the hills with them because, as I always say, for every anecdote, there's an anecdote. <laughs> so we um, got to look into them more. Anyhow, <clears throat> that's why it's important to talk to researchers doing the actual research and they can help us understand the science. Today, we are going to chat with Dr. Marco Lucic, a physician and researcher at the Arctic University of Norway, who recently did a study on modifiable risk factors for colon cancer. Modifiable, so essentially things in our life that we can possibly change to lower our risk. The study is titled the burden of colon cancer attributable to modifiable factors. And the data comes from the Norwegian Women and Cancer Study, and the study was published in August of 2022 in the International Journal of Cancer. Now guys, this is a really timely topic because there is an increase in colon cancer being diagnosed in young people, and other types of cancer too, by the way. Um, just this week, I read an article, kind of a scary article, in Nature Review about newly diagnosed cancers increasing in people under 50. It was titled, Is Early Onset Cancer an Emerging Global Epidemic? Just what we need, another epidemic, but it might be. It's really an alarming article. If you guys get a chance to read it, um, do so. And they also talked about the increasing rates of colon cancer in people under 50. In this episode, Dr. Luchik will talk us through his research, what data they used, about the specific modifiable risk factors and their link to new cases of colon cancer, how much these risk factors together explain the burden of colon cancer, and how much of that burden isn't explained by these modifiable risk factors. Also, for the coffee drinkers out there, myself included, I just had two cups. Um, <laughs> he also will add some really interesting things about coffee and its relationship to cancer. As always, I will include a link to his paper in the podcast description for anyone who would like to dive in deeper. So let's connect to Dr. Luchik and learn a few things. Okay, guys, today we are connecting with Dr. Marco Luchik in Nor Norway. Is that right? You're in Norway? Uh, Marco Lukic, yes, in Norway. No, okay. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's fine. Um, and we're going to talk about a very interesting paper that I read that you wrote or a study that you ran, the burden of colon cancer due to modifiable risk factors. Um, it was based on the Norwegian Women Cancer Study. That's where the data came from. And for our listeners, it, came, it was published in the International Journal of Cancer. This is a really timely topic, especially over here. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself first before we jump into the research? Yeah, absolutely, Erin. So uh, I am a medical doctor from University of Belgrade in Serbia. Uh, I finished my uh, Master of Public Health degree at the University of Tromsø, where I currently work, University uh, UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, way up north uh, in northern part of Norway. So we brag that we are the northernmost university in the world. 
Uh, at the same university, I finished my PhD in 2018, and currently I'm working at the Department of Community Medicine uh, as a postdoc. Awesome. Yeah, and my yeah my uh, research is revolves around cancer in okay. general, not only colon cancer but other cancer types as well. Okay. Um, yeah, when I was uh, in the introduction, I said there's an interest in colon cancer over here, a, a renewed interest because we're seeing increased rates in younger people. Um, which is why uh, I found your paper interesting just in terms of modifiable risk factors. Um, so in women in Norway, um, from 1955, I think, to 2014, there was a threefold increase in the incidence rate or new cases of colon cancer. It's the second most frequently diagnosed cancer in women after breast cancer. Um, and your study, you looked at some of the modifiable risk factors and how much they were contributing to the, this incidence rate, these new cases. I, yeah. I want can you, to, can you walk us through, um, well, maybe why did you, why were you interested in this first? And then maybe tell us a little bit about how you went about to get this data. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, like in any research, uh, fund to do the project and then you apply for those uh, for that project and you get to either get position or not. So this was the project that was uh, made by my, uh, my current su current supervisor, Professor Charlotte Riande. Uh, so uh, we go she got the funds to to run this project. And the whole point why this project was initiated is similar, like in US, as you say. Also in Norway, uh, we have an increased trend in uh, colon cancer uh, incidents. And as you said, from 1950s to uh, some late 1990s or early 2000s, it increased by threefold. Uh, we even after that period, we observed the increase in the incidence of colon cancer among Norwegian women. Recently, maybe in the last five years, this increase uh, began to slow down a bit. And I think um, Norwegian Cancer Register just reported their annual report for 2021 that it actually now dropped down a bit in women, which could be just a fork or just an artifact, and then it will continue to rise, or maybe now there will be a shift in incidence and it will actually start to decrease, the time will tell. But uh, the point is that uh, we could not explain this uh, increase in incidence, why is it happening? So basically what are the factors that are contributing to this, to the increase in, uh, this, uh, uh, in the incidence rates? We know from the World Cancer Research Fund and International Agency on Cancer Research, we know which are pretty much established risk factors for colon cancer. That would be uh, other than family history, that is a non-modifiable risk factor. You have a bunch of modifiable risk factors, among which are smoking, alcohol consumption, physical inactivity, uh, increased BMI or uh, overweight and obesity, and also intake of red and processed meat. Those are the factors that are increasing the risk of colon cancer. While you have also the factors that are decreasing the risk of colon cancer, those, those will be uh, increased physical activity. Then consumption of whole grains, um, cons uh, increase in, in intake of uh, uh, food items that are rich in fibers, and also calcium intake or food items that are rich in calcium. Those are the risk factors that are decreasing the risk of colon cancer. So we wanted to quantify how much of these factors individually and combined will explain this increase in incidence that is observed among uh, Norwegian women in the past two decades. Okay, and you used the data from um, Norwegian Women in Cancer Study, yes. Norwegian right. Women in Cancer Study, that's a nationally representative uh, cohort of Norwegian women that was uh, initiated in 1991 by Professor, uh, now he's Professor Emeritus, uh, Eilid Lund. And initially, the whole purpose of this cohort was to explore the association between different risk factors and breast cancer risk, mainly oral contraceptives. But then it expanded to other cancer sites and also certain death causes. Now, uh, this cohort involves some 170,000 women. We have questionnaire data. We have uh, a, a, a random sample of some 50,000 women were drawn blood. So we have uh, blood samples as well. 
And also we have in Norway, at least in other Scandinavian countries, we have very high quality cancer registry and other types of registry. So we have a very precise measurement of when did the outcome, in this case, cancer has occurred, have occurred. So that those are some of the strengths of working, I would say, with Scandinavian cohorts. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Like so, so lots of data, quality data there. Um, Relatively cool. Yeah. 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 We're, I know we're working on, on that now. There's a whole like data modernization effort to try to get centralized data faster and quicker. Um, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like in many yeah yeah i mean, I mean there I are COVID, problems here yeah, as well, yeah covid kind of was like the wake-up yeah. call like uh, hey guys we have to do this um mm -hmm. so i wanted to uh so okay so you looked at different exposures or risk factors the, and they're linked to colon cancer uh one thing i wanted to ask you about when you were calculating the population attributable fraction mm -hmm. or, or attributable risk i guess for each one you also considered a competing risk of death. And can you tell us what that means in as, as simple a way as you can? Oh, in a simple way, <laughs> it will be difficult. Well, basically, when you do whole epidemiological cohort studies, you will have a single outcome in a prospective design. So when you follow up a group of people for a very long period of time, you would have one uh, specific outcome that you're interested in. Well, let's say that's a colon cancer. So basically, uh, when you are studying colon cancer in particular, you're not interested in any other cancer types or what happened to these people. So basically, you assume that during the follow-up, these people uh, cannot get any other types of cancer or the fact that they are old and they, they might die because of different, co uh, different uh, causes does not really play any role in... Um, uh, in the colon cancer development. So basically, if you think about it, all of us can have several types of cancers during our lifetime. And they're basically these cancers or different health outcomes are competing which one will occur first. So, and normally when you do simple analysis, uh, I'm not going to name this analysis because I don't think it's uh, interesting, too, too interesting for your uh, uh, listeners. Uh, but when you do the standard types of uh, analysis, you don't take this in, into account. Basically, your, all, your, all of your diseases, in a way, are competing with that because you can always die. Any day you wake up, you can die that day. Right. But uh, this fact is not taken into account normally when we do standard uh, uh, analysis, statistical analysis in this specific study design. And here we did that. So that's one of the strengths that is... Uh, that one of the strengths of our paper that uh, that had to be done with this pretty novel method of calculating this population attributable fraction. And for your listeners, population attributable fraction basically tells you the number of the cases of certain disease in this colon cancer that could have been avoided if certain risk factor was completely eliminated from the population. So for example, what would happen with the number of colon cancer cases that were diagnosed, how many were, would be diagnosed if uh, all people were to lose weight and be, had normal BMI, or if none of, uh, none of Norwegian women were smokers, or were not drinking, or were eating uh, uh, red and processed meat with the national recommendations. Okay, okay. That was that was good because I um it was a good explanation even for me so I appreciate that um I wanted to to get into some of the results here so just the follow up time for the cohort you were looking at was around 19 years a little less than 19 years that's mm -hmm. right okay and and it was around a little over well 35,500 women a little over that yeah. okay yeah. um and what they were uh, older age at baseline when they were diagnosed so that means like the baseline is 19 years um, prior, is that right? Uh, yeah, so I'm not okay. sure what was the mean age at baseline. I probably have it in my I paper. think I wrote it down, it was like 40 or maybe- Something, so yeah, yeah, because the whole court was initiated in 1991, right. but we used the follow-up questionnaires that was sent to uh, these ladies in 1998. So, 
by default, right. they would have to be a bit older than they were in 1991. Right, right, right. Um, so I think you said there in the paper there was 430 new cases of colon cancer. Um, so let's talk about smoking. Smoking really stood out. Mm -hmm. So what did you find about smoking? So smoking, uh, smoking st status was the single most important factor that predicted, or not predicted, that explained the most of this burden of colon cancer among Norwegian women in that study period. So basically, uh, if our ladies that uh, in, in Norway, if they never started smoking, so combined former smokers and current smokers, if they never had uh, started smoking, then uh, you would have prevented 2,400 uh, cases uh, of colon cancer in Norway in the study period. And that would be around 18.7% of all colon cancer cases. Wow. And when you think about it, that's a substantial number, one-fifth of all the um, yeah. uh, of, of certain cancer types that can be prevented just by eliminating one factor. And uh, mind you that uh, smoking prevalence in Norway is constantly decreasing. And it has been decreasing from, I think, a very long time ago. But still, smoking uh, has is playing a significant role here. Uh, basically, uh, smoking, as you said, uh, it, stood, it, it stands out. Um, then there are other factors that contribute to, uh, to some lesser extent. For example, alcohol consumption, that was 14.5%. And uh, recent papers uh, and recommendation from World Cancer Research Fund say, say that there is no safe limit when it comes to alcohol consumption and risk of cancer. So zero is so something that we, that we all should aim for, unlike for cardiovascular diseases yes. where there are studies showing that one glass of wine a day uh, yes. might benefit you. But that should be also be taken with a, a grain, a pinch of salt, because yes, and yeah. you always have to measure the uh, cons and pros and weigh the risks, which is obviously for a, a normal person, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm very like, um, I really want to explore more about alcohol, like what you just said, I actually had this conversation with a friend the other day, um, talking about how there, there's, there's no safe amount of alcohol yeah. and uh, yeah. It's... For breast cancer, that's that's uh, almost yes. established that uh, when it comes to breast cancer, alcohol should be completely avoided. Wow. Uh, recently, just a few days or a few weeks ago, uh, another professor from my department, Tony Brand, he published a paper in which they also found that even small amounts of alcohol could uh, uh, shorten your life, as he concluded in his paper. So in general, uh, that from all causes. So in general, alcohol is something that should be avoided. But again, it's very difficult to uh, to expect farm. people yeah. to 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 have how, uh, to have high compliance when it comes to this kind of situation. <laughs> well, <laughs> so and then we try to limit, and yeah. certain different countries will have different uh, cutoffs on what is recommended. But normal, <laughs> it's one standard unit a day that uh, people should not go above that. Yeah, yeah. And I always tell people it's so difficult because our social lives, especially if you're over the Absolutely. age of 21, just so tied into Absolutely. alcoholic drinks. I mean, it's, it's just to change that. I mean, that's now that's a serious effort to try to change. That. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> happy hour. Um, yeah, happy hour. I wanted to go back to smoking for a second because yep. um, when I read your paper, I, I thought this was interesting. There wasn't really a difference between the risk of uh, in the risk between current smokers and former smokers. Is that right? Um, when it comes to, yeah, well, current smokers have slightly higher risk of uh, um, uh, colon cancer compared to former smokers. And there is a relatively, not simple explanation, but there is an explanation for that. You see, every, every disease has its latency period. So latency period basically means the period of time before the first changes in your cell level occur, basically first cancer cell or changes on even uh, uh, on genes that will later result in full-blown cancer that will be diagnosed. And for certain uh, uh, diseases, this latency period is very, very long. 
for example, for transversal coal, and I think I read it's around 40 years. So basically to be able to capture the, the real effect of smoking on colon cancer, you would need data. Uh, so if person was diagnosed, let's say in 2020, you would need data on their lifestyle from 40 years before that, how they were behaving 40 I years see. before that. Okay. And most of these people, former smokers, were probably smoking at the time when these uh, when this disease actually started and was way beyond, uh, uh, it, it wasn't able to be diagnosed at that time. That's why we were focusing on early, early diagnostics so much. But uh, normally colon cancer uh, is still diagnosed in most of the people when the symptoms occur. Uh, nowadays, in order at least, they're trying to, uh, to to implement national screening programs, which will allow for uh, cancer uh, cases to be detected earlier. But in, uh, to go back to this former and current, I think the reason for for this small difference is the fact that former smokers were actually former smokers at the uh, when they gave the uh, when they filled in the questionnaires. In 1996, but at the time when the, uh, the the disease actually started, which might have been 10 years before that, they were smokers. Ah, I see. So you don't okay. see that's huge of a difference, even though you see some 12 percent, uh, 12 point uh, uh, difference between former and current smoking. I but see. that would be one of the one of the. Uh, yeah, no, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I just to be clear to our listeners, there's huge benefits mm -hmm. in quitting smoking if you if you're smoking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but. Yeah, but long-term effect, at least on cancer, you cannot expect immediately. That's the right, whole point. Right, 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 right. Um, so the whole point is never to start smoking. <laughs> yeah. begin with. That's, yeah, that's the safest. Uh, yeah. um, I remember I, I, during college, our, physio our physiology professor at West Point, he's like, um, on smoking, he's like, don't start. And if you do quit, he just kept saying that the whole lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that's absolutely it's, true. Yeah, I mean, it's just very simple, yeah. but hard to follow. And it's very simple, but yeah, yeah, and that's a public health message for you. Yeah, just don't start smoking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of physical activity, uh, <laughs> was that a, a significant there in terms of as a preventive factor? In general, I avoid uh, using terms significant or statistical significance or okay. not because it's based on a cutoff point that was made by one guy, what, hundreds over hundred years ago. <laughs> okay. But it's, it's just stuck with us because <laughs> in general, people hate uncertainty and they just want to have clear cut, tell me if this is beneficial or not. And then we base on this ridiculous one point, which is not useless, far from it, but to put so much emphasis on it, it's it's uh, I think it's wrong. And luckily, I, nowadays there is some shift in this kind of thinking. So here, physical activity found that it's um, uh, uh, that it's also contributing to um, uh, colon cancer burden, ten point eight percent of all colon cancer cases uh, are attributable to low physical low physical activity. Uh, and if you look at strictly this p value, it's not st statistically significant. But this statistical significance is not something that we should put too much emphasis on, because yeah. we can always argue if our sample was way higher than thirty-five thousand women, if it was three hundred fifty thousand women, ten times higher, then there is a strong chance that this will be statistically significant. If if this is still important. But uh, here, yeah. if you look at the point estimate of 10.8%, that's uh, from public public, public uh, uh, health, health perspective, yeah. that's, that's, that's also important. Yeah. 11%, so that, that's every 10th case, if you were to reach certain level of physical activity that is uh, recommended. And that ties in with uh, a higher BMI, that's a risk factor yeah. as well. Yeah. And that was one of the things that was uh, quite surprising that we did not find uh, uh, that the large proportion of cancer cases was attributable to BMI. Uh, then again, we know that BMI, uh, first of all, is not the most precise measure of uh, overweight right. and obesity. Right. As we know that muscular in men 
would normally have be very low lean, very low fat percentage, but will have high BMI just because of muscle mass. Mm-hmm. And so similar in women, women generally have uh, lower BMI, uh, even below 20, and they would look perfectly normal. So BMI is not really the perfect measure. And it's also, there is one thing that uh, should be taken into account here. BMI is also uh, weight, not height, but weight changes significantly over time. And here we just captured BMI at one point in time. So we don't know, we did not take into account what happens to BMI, uh, uh, during, what happened to this BMI during the follow-up. So these could be some explanations, but then we did not find anything that at least BMI over 25 uh, uh, kilograms per square meter explained only around 1% of all the, of all the colon cancer cases. Okay. Yeah. And I think people just use it because it's kind of like an easy population level. Measurement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's but, very easy to calculate it. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Just, but it's definitely not, um, and it really does depend on shape and everything. Um, absolutely. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about diet. I thought this was yeah. interesting. Um, oh, very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Whatever you want to start. You can start with the meat. I was reading like yeah. about the meat versus the processed meat. It was so funny when I was reading the article, I was craving meatballs and I was like, wait, meatballs are processed meat. <laughs> yeah, me, yeah. Yeah. Meatballs are like, processed meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a very interesting, this whole debate around the meat uh, and uh, colon cancer uh, risk. So uh, WCRF or World Cancer Research Fund, uh, if you read the report, processed meat, there are convincing evidence that processed meat is uh, increasing the risk of colon cancer. Uh, we did, we couldn't have done the separate analysis on red meat and processed meat, and that was because of some statistical constraints, small, uh, small sample or small number of women that in Norway reported eating large quantities of these, these types of meat. So we had to combine total red and processed meat, but nevertheless, you would expect something to come up with, uh, out of it, but only 1.4% uh, of all the colon cancer cases was attributable uh, to women eating more than 500 grams of uh, red and processed meat combined per week, which is a national recommendation. Uh, and that's a very low number. But again, all these dietary exposures, they belong to this group of, uh, of this uh, field of epidemiology called nutritional epidemiology. And uh, if I was to ask you, Erin, uh, how much processed meat do you eat per week? Would you know how to answer this question for me? No, and I probably would want to make myself look better too in some ways. Absolutely, you have the social desirability <laughs> bias. Absolutely, and uh, funny, I was, I was, I was asked exactly the same question by one nutritional students. They they checked some uh, uh, tool how to assess uh, the nutrient intake in uh, some surveys or more patients, and then she asked me, I remember how much uh, uh, did you eat. Post sale, uh, those are sausages in Norwegian, uh, sausages. And at that time, I was I was eating them a lot because I was home alone, not with my family. And then I was eating crappy food, and but I was a bit embarrassed to say that, it's like, exactly like you say now. Yeah. And then you always have this uh, strong urge to present yourself healthier than you actually do, to live healthier lifestyle uh, more do, more so than you actually do. But in general, even if I was to be honest completely and say, okay, I'm going to give you an honest answer how much processed meat I'm eating. Honestly, myself, I have no idea. I have no idea how much processed meat I eat per week. First of all, it will fluctuate a lot during a week. And also I have no idea, you know, like grams, how much of salami do I, might I eat during a, a week or what is on the pizza that I would eat, how much processed meat is on the pizza. And this is very well known uh, uh, problem uh, in nutritional epidemiology and uh, especially young men. Research has shown that young men are especially terrible when assessing what kind of diet they have. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to separate food items like processed meat, red meat, white meat, maybe they go to gym and they're very obsessed on what they eat. Maybe they will be more precise. But in general population, it's very difficult to assess uh, 
uh, the intake of different nutrients because we do we yeah. have no idea what we, have, we don't know i also think too like just what does processed mean a lot a lot of people might like if i go to the store for example and i buy like natural all natural meat or something or you know you might be a a fool for buzzwords um and be like okay what is this is not processed this is processed just on a very basic level but if you talk about processed meat and the things that are bad in processed meat well according to wcrf again World Cancer Research Fund, uh, there are three kind of accepted mechanisms on how red and processed meat are increasing the risk of colon cancer. First, uh, if you cook meat on high temperatures, that's bad because it produces certain chemicals that are not good for you and that can alter your DNA and make these changes in uh, mucosis and in initiate this oncogenic process. Uh, uh, then heme iron or iron from the meat, increased intake of iron was also sh shown to have some uh, uh, DNA damaging effects. And from the processed meats, it's actually the high salt content. And when you talk about salt, first thing is not colon, it's hypertension, which is true. Salt is very bad if you have hypertension or it's a huge risk factor for hypertension. But at the same time, salt has also shown that damages this mucosis of your large intestine. So, and that if you damage certain cells and they have to repeat uh, to repair themselves and repeat this over and over again, then there is a huge, uh, there is increased uh, probability of something get, uh, uh, going wrong at some time sure. with this whole Sure. repairing process and that's how you initiate for your first cancer cells in the long run so those are the main thing on when it comes to process what is bad about that, processed meat yeah. and then there are other things on what kind of additives are uh uh stuffed they, they stuffed in these kind of meat but i'm not sure uh, about research that's not my field of expertise so i would not dare to comment if there is any of yeah. these emulgators that are uh, proven to 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 uh, to be causally uh, uh, linked to colon cancer yeah. risk. I guess we should all go back to being uh, our hunter gatherers. Um. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but I mean, when you think about it, it's not if this is true uh, that these mechanisms are correct. Then red meat per se, raw red meat, shouldn't be carcinogenic because raw. we were eating. Was raw meat, mm. yeah, from the yeah, from no, the, that's uh, that's not happening anytime soon here. <laughs> yeah, but when you when you process it your way, you fry it on a bunch of oil and, and uh, whatnot, then yeah. that's that's the that's the dangerous stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been following intermittent fasting like as a pattern, mm. but um, so I and I try to eat healthy, but um, just feels like. You can't you can't possibly know everything that you're ingesting um yeah no, there is there is i mean but that depends then on a on a, on a government level what is what are the <laughs> yeah regulations but yeah. and i guess there are also differences in uh, what kind of processing of food is happening in different countries that's for sure that's true that's true i know it's different like from here in, in europe uh you know even just yeah. antibiotic regulations that kind of thing yeah, absolutely absolutely um, and Calcium and fiber lowered the risk some. Mm -hmm. well, uh, for calcium is uh, known from before. That's not uh, that's not a, a surprise. Uh, for fiber intake, even though we did not find some huge, um, uh, uh, yeah, only one point seven percent. But again, intake of fibers and. Uh, in this case, I have to just tell you that people did not say, they did not receive a question how much fiber do you eat a day or per week. They would give a bunch of different food items and then nutritionists would calculate, approximate the intake of fibers for these women. Uh, so again, same as for processed meat, uh, you have to know exactly how much food that are rich in fibers you're eating per day in order to give a precise right. information right so sure. which is again very difficult to like any other uh, food item yeah. and same goes with calcium intake maybe slightly easier because people do know more i think how much milk they they, they drink per day or if they drink at all 
So it might be a bit different. And plus, you know, when you talk about calcium intake, there are also calcium supplements that some people are are taking, which is something that I would not recommend to do in order to prevent colon cancer, definitely. Um, and you guys didn't look at coffee at all, right? Yeah, why? Funny that you're asking that. Why are you asking that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a big coffee fan, and I've read yeah. a lot of different things about how coffee shows, um, it seems preventive against certain types of cancers. Um, of course, like other people are like, coffee's horrible for you. It's it's damaging to your nerves. This and that. Um, I was just curious. What do you? What is your opinion on coffee? Well, I, I'm I'm not sure if you're asking me this because of my PhD. No, my P, my PhD was on coffee and cancer, so that's why. I oh, well, <laughs> no, it just came to me though. You're so in the, luck. The, <laughs> <laughs> the universe was sending me some vibes here, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, for, four, just... for four years I was studying coffee and cancer. Oh, well, this and, is great. Uh, to be yeah, to be honest, you know, when you when you're working with a certain exposure, one single exposure, not only do people start making fun of you and call you coffee guy. But it's also, uh, <laughs> it becomes boring a bit, you know. But yeah, I did coffee and uh, uh, coffee and cancer was the title of my PhD that I finished in 2018. And among other things, it was a colon cancer that we, uh, uh, that we explored the association between intake of, uh, well, types of coffee that are drunk in, in Norway, and that would be mainly filtered coffee, to some extent, instant coffee and then boiled coffee. And I don't think boiled coffee is consumed in the US. Um, and what we found that overall total coffee consumption, and mind you that Norway is uh, world number two when it comes to uh, coffee consumption. So this is the, the country that drinks less coffee only compared to Finland. Finland is number one. Uh, we did find some now I should choose my words carefully, uh, beneficial effects of coffee on uh, total cancer risk and some for co colorectal cancer, not colon, but colorectal cancer. Uh, according again to uh, World Cancer Research Fund, coffee is known that it's now it's almost, there are convincing evidence that coffee is protecting against liver cancer and endometrial cancer, uh, uh, cancer of uterus. So that's kind of almost established, but it's still unclear when it comes to uh, other cancer types. What we concluded in our research, in this coffee cancer research, is that even large amounts of coffee are safe when it comes to uh, cancer risk. Don't okay. expect that uh, it will prevent you from getting cancer. Maybe it will. I would not uh, uh, ever recommend anyone, yeah, drink a lot of coffee to prevent cancer. That's just, <laughs> even if I had found something yeah. that, that, would, that would point in the direction, I would never say that. Basically, as I want to think about it, we did a safety study. Is it safe to drink more than seven cups of coffee? And believe me, we have uh, some of our participants dr drinking even 14 cups of coffee a day. Uh, but obviously that's not safe for other reasons and that would be on cardiovascular level that this amount of coffee is not healthy but uh when it comes to cancer at least it does not increase the risk of cancer that's interesting no that's great to know um yeah i mean I'm yeah, a big i, I, I heard that a lot person. trust me yeah <laughs> <laughs> but people always also oh, what what's what's happening is it is it decreasing decreasing risk of cancer yeah and i'm just thinking oh not again this thing <laughs> <laughs> no i i promise i didn't Ask because I knew you were no, the coffee I, I guy. You. And now that I, I know you're you. the coffee guy, I'm gonna... yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so you all in all, you discovered I think 46% of new colon cancer cases could be attributed to these risk factors, which combined. combined. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's good news in some way because people can uh, make changes to possibly lower their risk. Absolutely. But uh, then again, I mean, how realistic is it to remove all these factors, risk factors from the people? It's not. The, it's not. It's not at all. Obviously, that's not uh, yeah. uh, uh, at all. But still, it's very important to know that there are 50 or so. Uh, now I'm completely ignoring the confidence interval around this number, which is 23% to 62%. But still, there is a substantial number of colon cancer cases apparently according to our study, they are unexplained or this increase in incidence. Right. So 
there are some other factors that have, take, have to be taken into account. And normally, if you read a certain epidemiological books, or I hope all of them, uh, for example, uh, Bhopal's uh, concepts of epidemiology, what he says in this book is that when you observe kind of epidemic of certain disease or sudden increase in incidence of certain disease, first you have to omit or to um, uh, exclude all the artifacts that could have led to this uh, increase in incidence. That would be, for example, some new diagnostic procedures that is way better in capturing the, the, this disease, some screening program, or better reporting. In some uh, uh, less uh, developed countries, you would have new systems put in place to report certain non-communicable diseases. And then what you can observe during the first year after these uh, systems are implemented, you would see a huge rise in the number of new cases, but that's just because uh, they have a better overview of how many are actually diagnosed and reported to some central agency or whatever. So uh, also for colon cancer, we have to explore also if there are any of these kind of artifacts before we go further. I see. Um, and what other, I mean, just what other factors might be at play that we know about that like, <laughs> Like family history, right? That's family history is definitely a, a, a risk factor. We know that. Uh, currently, I'm uh, writing uh, another application to get funded. I hope uh, for some kind of medication use and um, and colon cancer risk. For example, we know that uh, acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin uh, is decreasing the risk of colon cancer, but it's always interesting to see if there are some medications that are been, that have been used for a very long time might actually increase the risk of colon cancer. So that could be one of the things. Uh, and what kind of medication honest, can I, or what class of medication might increase? I, I don't dare to say that because okay. it's, there, are, there were a couple of what we call drug wide association studies where they have bunch of um, uh, groups of medication according to what we call ATC codes. Uh, so each medication has its own ATC code. So a group of medication will have certain ATC uh, code on a higher level. Uh, so there were some studies when they would just compare different ATC codes with a bunch of other cancer sites. And then you would find certain associations with certain types of cancers, but that's all very, very preliminary. And I wouldn't dare even to tell you what kind I of see. medications those okay. are, because you can't really trust these results before they're replicated on a larger scale or, or right. uh, they're replicated by others, other right. large holes. Right, right, right. No, that, no, that's good, because someone might hear something and then run with it. And, yeah, yeah, and then know. they would, yeah. <laughs> and we, we don't want that. Um, well, thank you so much. Those those were uh, the questions I had. I found it very interesting. Um, sounds like you are doing some uh, or plan to do more interesting research in this area. So uh, well, of course, I hope so. To get money, yes, uh, so funding. always in research, yeah, <laughs> funding. Money, everything runs. Yeah. <laughs> funding is so important. Money. Funding is so important. Yeah. 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 Money. Um, but uh, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I thought it was great. Um, I think. Um, I'm sure my listeners will find this beneficial. So I appreciate yeah, your time. Yeah. I hope so. And thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And I'll stay in touch. If, you, if there's any other interesting studies, um, please yeah. you know, come back on. Absolutely. Yeah, I will notify you. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Enjoy the rest of your day there. Yeah, likewise. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like causes or cures, please share, subscribe, help get the word out. I really appreciate it. If you have any feedback, comments, etc., etc., you can message me through my website, bloomingwellness.com, or find me on social media too, always an option, though I'm not on there um, as much as I used to be. Okay, so continuing with this new trend of ending each episode with a quote, um, and again, these quotes may or may not be related to the podcast. They can be completely random, but we're just ending with a quote based off of um, feedback from a listener. This quote is from Nickel and Dimed on not getting by in America. Now, if you haven't read this book, I recommend it. It's a really good public health book because 
It's about a woman trying to take care of herself and her health while working low-wage jobs in America. So it dives into a lot of the determinants of health and certainly risk factors for disease, but in a creative way, which I think is the best way because uh, it, it helps you remember it more. It makes it more impactful, more colorful in your brain, so to speak. Okay, so here's the quote. Something is wrong, very wrong, when a single person in good health, a person who in addition possesses a working car, can barely support herself by the sweat of her brow. You don't need a degree in economics to see that wages are too low and rents too high. The book's been out for a while, but uh, you should read it because it's still, the, the themes in there still apply today, sadly. Um, all right, guys, that's it. Uh, hopefully I'll see you here next time. New, we'll have some interesting shows coming up, hopefully. Um, that's it. Bye-bye.